speaker is uh, Major General Richard Romer. I've known the general, oh, for a long, long time, ever since Garth Drabinsky and I bought the motion picture rights to a novel, a uh, fantasy, I guess you would call it, uh, called Ultimatum. Richard wrote it how many years ago? Wow, in 1973, the year after City TV was launched. And it uh, projected the possibility of an American invasion of Canada. After that, I really got interested in the general because I met not only his work, but his progeny. I'm talking about Ann Romer, who then became a major personality at City TV. So my relationship with uh, the general is doubly blessed. So come on up here, Richard. I'm not entirely sure what the general's going to talk about. That's good. All right. <laughs> uh, in terms of something concrete, there are things going on in our country at the moment uh, that uh, deserve looking at. And I want to talk with you in three ways about transportation, and transportation in a way that you've never seen before. Back in 73, uh, I became part of a conference called the Great Plains Project. And we were under the aegis of the Prime Minister of the day, uh, Trudeau, and he wanted us to look, at this little group, look at developmental projects in the high north. And I had been involved with something else I'll tell you about in relation to the north. So I became vice chairman of this little group. Vern Atchwell, who was the leader, and I knew that up here in the in these islands, Sverbrip Basin, a lot of natural gas had been discovered in the early 70s. So we said, how could anybody get the gas out of here? So we decided we would approach two firms. One was Boeing and the other Douglas. And say, we said to them, can you devise some means whereby we can fly this stuff out? Well, they snapped at it. Now, Douglas came up with, the, with a, a version of its own airplane that had been producing, but Boeing really went at it. Uh, Boeing came up with this design. They worked hard on it, and I have all of the details. It is three times the size of a 747. How does that grab you? That's an enormous airplane. I'm just showing you the basic uh, aspects of it. Uh, 330 feet uh, long, uh, how many feet wide? 200, oh, it's about 400, 500 feet wide, but it's a stable, simple design with 12 uh, engines, and what they came up with was the prospect of having the payload in these tubes, in the, in, in the wings, so that the, uh, it could be carried properly. Well, this was wonderful. The reality was that the pipeline was going to be built in those days. The pipeline is, is, was not built but it is going to be built soon. So here's an idea. Now, Mid-Canada Development Corridor concept. About, uh, about the end of the 60s, I was looking at a map of Canada, and I looked at a certain part of it and said to myself, this could be a, an area in which people could live. And from that uh, came the Mid-Canada Development Corridor. The green part here is called the boreal forest. It's, the boreal forest is a function of temperature, and it exists in, in Russia, Siberia as well. It goes right around the top. So Akers did this great study. They looked at railways, and we came up with an idea of a development corridor. And the development corridor, if you looked at it, it would have railways, roads, and new centers. We believe that this land is viable, it's, uh, you can live in it. We knew that millions of people were going to come uh, to Canada over the next 30 years, and they have. Our population in the, in the period of time has grown by about 10 million, and people from all over the world are here. Here is a section of the world that is open, and it has to be, however, planned. We should have a plan for the future orderly development of mid-Canada. And in in 1971, I took the report with my little team to present it to the Governor General, who had been my senior law partner, 
in the 50s and 60s, and this fellow on the right. And the fellow on the right, when I briefed him with using slides, I could tell he hadn't seen the material, couldn't have cared less, and what happened was that the Mid-Canada concept died fundamentally, but it's still alive in various places. Some of us have grown older in the, in the period. And there's another little idea that I've kicked around for a long time, and nobody's, nobody's paid any attention to it, and it may not be paid attention to today. Uh, the idea is a mobile House of Commons. Look, we've got, <laughs> <laughs> we've got uh, aircraft, we've got the 747, we've got technology, uh, we've got uh, computers now, we've got the world by the communications tail. And what would prevent the House of Commons being moved to Vancouver for six months? The deputies could come out, or they could stay in Ottawa, probably wouldn't matter all that much. <laughs> but, but you'd have people from the province of Quebec, the Bac uh, people, would have to go <laughs> to, to British Columbia to see what it looks like for a change. Uh, there's an opportunity to go to, to uh, St. John's in Newfoundland, uh, in the arena there. Put that, yeah, give them a, give them a cigar. <laughs> but you can get the whole of the House of Commons. What is it, about 308 people? You can get them all, plus the speaker, on one 747 and take them there. Then they can get back and forth, they can total communication with their computers and staff, and it would be a, such a simple thing to do. Someone said to me when they heard about this mobile uh, House of Commons, uh, what would happen if the airplane crashed with everybody on board? Uh, but in any event, that's one of the risks that, are, that we have to take. Now, <laughs> now Moses has gone into hiding because, <laughs> because we've known each other for so long and been connected in so many ways that uh, I think he's probably afraid to come out and give me the hook. But the reality is, <laughs> I don't need one, because I have finished my presentation to you, and I thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>